Am I allowed to stay on the premises when you're not here? Yeah, I don't mind. Oh, cool. Right. Right then, viewers. You... <laughs> Bugger off. You've got things to do. Go and do things. Go and be a responsible parent. Oh, he's going in, Nigel. Is he? <laughs> Let's wave goodbye to the nice captain. Oh, and we can get some moving pictures of Project Nigel. Da, 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 da. Here, the mighty roar of the. Oh, where's he going? Turns off the bloody gazebo here. And as Nigel leaves the VIP park. <laughs> The YouTube channel's not any good, but he's a nice guy. I'm sorry, just a moment. Sorry about that. Right then, viewers. The longer term amongst you might remember a couple of episodes of A Key Saga, which has yet to be concluded. Now, I won't bore you too much by going back over all of the disasters of the trying to get a wretched key sorted for the uh, Toro, which is now the company car, but it has not been done. Now, I am being left to my own devices here at and around PNHQ, whilst the good captain goes and does responsible parent duties. And he has imparted the news that there is a shop in the village that might be able to help. So, I am going to perambulate myself down to said shop to see if we can put an end to this wretched key saga. Hmm. That's 36A and 36B. Well, I've walked about a hundred miles and the only shop I've seen that could be anything like the sort of place that might cut a key was closed. So, I don't think the great Rover Key Saga is going to be solved today. The struggle goes on. And now, I've broken wind. Right, this is obviously the place that he was on about. And as you can see, it is very much closed. From Friday the 9th until Monday the 19th. So, that's not happening today then, is it? It's pouring down with rain. I'm in the north and I'm wet. Captain Mustard here has been putting his fingers into pies. I don't know why, he just told me to tell you that.
go all the way to Sheffield and I'm just going to go around the island again because apparently there's a spur of some sort that related to the original intent of this junction. And it very much didn't happen and now they're talking about um, building a tunnel. Him 
hitting the hood with his fist. The volume of the world seemed to be turned up so the air molecules hummed a deep bass note. And if the fire siren went off, it would knock a person into the middle of next week. The moon rose over the frozen lake. The light seemed to come out of the snow, buried in three feet of light, and colors jumped out, hundreds of lovely shades of shadows, browns, grays, and blacks, so that if a woman with bright red lipstick had appeared, a person would fall over back from the practical. On this cold night, the skating rink was a carnival. The music I could hear when I left my house, and now I saw the long fee of colored lights hung out across the rink from the warming house, its windows blazing white, pairs of skaters flowing counterclockwise in a great loop to the blue skirt walls, and little kids buzzing around the big slow wheel as it turned, and I looked for the girl I loved, who I had met the night before. She was older, 18 or 19, and had worn bright lipstick and sat down beside me in the warming house and slowly unlaced her leather boots and took them off and then her socks as my face turned red. She was a cousin of the Hinkvists, up from Minneapolis for Christmas vacation and had a way about her that set her apart. Her hair, for example, was jet black and cut short as a man's. She wore a short skirt and tights, but unlike other girls whose tights were lumpy from long underwear, hers were tight. She leaned against me and said, got a cigarette? No girl asked me that before because I didn't smoke, but for her sake, I said, yeah, thinking I might have one, certainly was worth a look. Who would say no at a time like that? Then I said, oh, I just remembered. I forgot mine at home. She said, oh, well, I think I've got two in my purse and offered one to me. I didn't smoke, but then I was young. I'd been held back. It was time to get started, so I said, thanks. She gave me the book of matches. I lit one and held it toward her mouth. She held my hand to steady it. We took deep drags and blew out big clouds of smoke. Then she leaned back and inhaled again. And I leaned forward and put my head between my knees. Not sick, exactly. Just appreciating it more than most people do. I was 16. I experienced everything deeply. Later, we walked up the hill toward Main Street. I wasn't so sure what I could show her in Lake Wobegon that would be interesting to someone from Minneapolis. So I made up a story about a woman named Lydia Farrell who had lived here in love with the memory of a boy who had drowned and picked out a house, Florian Krebsbach's house, as the home where this Lydia Farrell spent 50 years in solitude cherishing the few brief moments of love she spent with young Eddie before his boat overturned in a sudden storm. And the moral of my story was that we must seize our few bright moments and live as deeply as we can it surprised me how easily I told her this lie and kept her interested. We walked up to the ink vests, both enjoying Lydia's sweet, sad life, and we sat in her car. We sat in the car, her arm around my neck, mine around her waist. We sat in the car for a while, and after, after a while, I said, I never did this before, but she seemed to be aware of that.
The town of Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, lies on the shore against Adams Hill, looking east across the blue-green water to the dark woods. From the south, the highway aims for the lake, bends hard left by the concrete Grecian grain silos, and eases over a leg of the hill past the slow children's sign, bringing the traveler in on Main Street toward the town's one traffic light, which is almost always green. A quarter mile away, a silver boat sets off the weeds in Sunfish Bay. A man in a bright blue jacket waves his pole. The line is hooked on weeds. The sun makes a trail of shimmering lights across the water. It would make quite a picture if you had the right lens, which nobody in this town has got. It is a quiet town where much of the day you could stand in the middle of Main Street and not be in anyone's way couldn't stand there forever, but as long as a person would want to stand in the middle of the street, because it is a wide street. The early Yankee promoters thought they would need it wide to handle the great crush of traffic. The double white stripe, though, is for show, as are the two parking meters, which was all they could afford. They meant to buy more parking meters with the revenue, but nobody puts nickels in them because parking nearby is free. Parking is diagonal. In school we sang, Hail to thee, Lake Wobegon, the cradle of our youth. We shall uphold the blue and gold in honor and in truth. Holding high our lamps, we will be thy champs, and will vanquish far and near. For WHS, the beacon of the West, the school we love so dear. But those were only for show. In our hearts, our loyalties to home have always been more modest, along the lines of the motto on the town crest, Sumus quote Sumus, we are what we are, and the annual Christmas toast of the Sons of Canute, there is no place like home when you're not feeling well, first uttered by a long-ago Canute who missed the annual dinner dance due to a case of the trots. In truth, in school and in church, we were called to high ideals, such as truth and honor, by someone perched up on truth and hollering for us to come on up. But the truth was that we always fell short, and left to our own devices, we Wobegonians go straight for small potatoes. What is majestic doesn't appeal to us. We like the Grand Canyon better, with Clarence and Arlene standing in front of us, smiling feel uneasy at momentous events. Incorporated under the laws of Minnesota, but omitted from the map due to the incompetence of surveyors, first named New Albion by New Englanders who thought it would become the Boston of the West, taking its ultimate name Lake Wobegon from an Indian phrase that means either here we are or we sat all day in the rain waiting for you. Lake Wobegon is the seat of tiny Mist County, the phantom county in the heart of the heartland, founded by Unitarian missionaries and Yankee promoters, then found by Norwegian Lutherans who straggled in from the west, and by German Catholics who were bound for Clay County, stopped a little short, having misread their map, and refused to admit it. A town with few scenic wonders such as towering pines or high mountains, but with some fine people of whom some are over six feet tall. Its highest point is the gold ball on the flagpole atop the Norge Co-op Grain Elevator south of town on the Great Northern Railway Spur, from which Mr. Tollefson can see all of Mist County when he climbs up to raise the flag on national holidays including Norwegian Independence Day. Lake Wobegon is mostly poor sandy soil, and every spring the earth heaves up a new crop of rocks, piles of rock ten feet high in the corners of fields, picked by generations of us, monuments to our industry. Our ancestors chose the place, tired from their long journey, sad for having left Norway behind, and this place reminded them of there, so they settled here, 
forgetting that they had left Norway because the land wasn't so good. So the new life turned out to be a lot like the old, except the winters are worse. Since arriving in the new world, the good people of Lake Wobegon have been skeptical of progress. And when the first automobile chugged into town, driven by the Inkvis twins, the crowd's interest was muted, less wholehearted than if there had been a good fire. When the first strains of music wafted from a radio, people said, I don't know. For this reason, it's a hard place to live in from the age of 14 on up to whenever you recover. At that age, you're no skeptic, but a true believer starting with belief in yourself as a natural phenomenon never before seen on this earth and therefore incomprehensible to all the others. This belief is not encouraged where I come from. Sister Brunhilde was coaching a Krebsbach on his catechism one morning in Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility lunchroom and suddenly asked a question out of order. Why did God make you? she said sharply as if it were an accusation the boy opened his mouth wavered then looked at a spot on the linoleum and put his breakfast there he ran to the lavatory and sister after a moment's thought strolled down the hall to the fifth grade classroom who wants to be a nurse when she grows up she asked six girls raised their hands and she picked betty deaner Nurses help sick people in many different ways, she told Betty as they walked to the lunchroom. They have many different jobs to do. Now here's one of them. The mop is in the kitchen. Be sure to use plenty of pine saw. So, most of Lake Wobegon's children leave as I did to realize themselves as finer persons than they were allowed to be at home. When I was 12, I had myself crowned King of Altrusia by my playmates and took the royal rubber-tipped baton and was pulled by my Altrusian people in a red wagon to the royal woods and was adored by them all afternoon, although it was a hot one. They did not complain or think the honor should have gone to them. They hesitated a moment when I got in the wagon, but then I said, Forward! And they saw there can be only one Vincent the First, and that it was me. And when I stood on the royal stump and blessed them in the sacred Altrusian tongue, Aru Aru Halama Ramadama no Shadrach Meshach Abednego, and Duane laughed, and I told him to die. He did die. And when I turned and marched away, I knew that they were following me. From the time I was 14, I ran a constant low fever waiting for my ride to come and take me away to something finer in life, and lay in bed at night watching the red beacon on top of the water tower, a clear signal of the beauty and mystery of a life that waited for me far away, and thought of Houseman's poem, loveliest of trees the cherry now is hung with bloom along the bough, and would have run away to where people would appreciate me, had I known of such a place, had I thought my parents would understand, but if I had said, along the woodland I must go to see the cherry hung with snow, <clears throat> they would have said, oh no you don't, you're going to stay right here, do what I told you to do three hours ago, and besides those aren't cherry trees, those are crab apples. Now I lie in bed in St. Paul, Minnesota, and look at the moon, which reminds me of the one over Lake Wobegon. I'm 43 years old. I have not lived there for 25 years. I have lived in a series of 11 apartments and three houses, most within a few miles of each other in St. Paul. Every couple of years, the urge strikes me again to pack up my books and unscrew the table legs and haul off to a new house. The mail is forwarded sometimes from a house several stops back down the line, the front of the envelope covered with forwarding addresses. But friends are lost, more all the time. It's sad to think about it. I went back to Lake Wobegon for a visit in August 
and saw Wayne Warning Track Tomerdahl hit the 5,000th long fly ball of his Whippet baseball career. You move that fence 40 feet in, Wayne could be in the major leagues, said Uncle Al, seeing greatness where it had not so far appeared. Toast and Jelly Days was over, but the Mist County Fair had begun, and I paid my quarter to jump 25 feet at the hay jump, landing in the stack a few feet from Mrs. Carl Krebsbach, who asked, what brings you back here? Good question. One that several dogs in town had brought up since I arrived. Talking to Father Emil outside the Chatterbox Cafe, I made a little mistake. I pointed north in reference to Daryl Tollerud's farm where the gravel pit was, where the naked man fell out the back door of the camper when his wife popped the clutch a few years ago. And of course, Daryl's farm isn't north, it's west. And I corrected myself, but Father Emil looked at me strangely, as if to say, aren't you from here then? Well, yes, I am. Home, sweet home, my lovelies. Thanks for your company. See you next time.